so when you were going through, the, through these difficulties, you know, what was going through your mind, uh, you know, like when that was going on? Well, one of the main things, I'm a big family girl, so I was in another state. I didn't know anybody here. I thought I was just, you know, single sex in the city. You know, my boyfriend, now husband, was away from me. And at first I thought I was doing it, and then I realized how isolated I was. Um, and it was just one of those things where it's like, I also had a boyfriend who had a good job. So he told me I could move back with him. I had a family that loved me. They understood that I was hurting so I could come back home. But I, you know, you have to feel like I am wherever I am, when, whenever I feel stuck or whenever I feel just unmovable, you just have to ask, why am I living through this? Why am I living to tell the story? Not why am I here? Why am I still alive to tell the story? You know, why am I able to get up in the morning and keep going? Why did I arrive here? So for me, what was going through my head was, I don't want to quit. And because I don't want to, I have to move the want and the desire to, I can't quit. I am not going home. I came here for a reason. I don't know what the heck it is right now, but I'm here. Yeah, I think that's powerful in terms of that determination. Um, and, you know, that determination led you to what? So what happened after, you know, those difficulties? How did you, how did you see yourself through? Well, I actually created my first biz, my first version of the Purpose Broker. It failed. That was six years ago. But I, even though something doesn't always work out the first time, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're wrong. You're not doing your purpose. You're not just doing what you're sent here to do. Sometimes things just take practice, time, patience, and life is just a test, you know? And so um, really, especially when I was upset about seeing some of the things that my father was experiencing, I was like, beep y'all, you know, I, I know who I am. You know, I was, I was like, I quit the job. I went waiting tables 70 hours a week, going door to door, got cops called on me, but I was like, I'm committed, you know? Just because you're committed and just because you're passionate doesn't mean it always works out. So I actually got sick and all those good benefits I had, I had no more insurance because I was waiting tables. So I don't know if I had this little New York, you know, image in my head of this girl waiting tables that was just going to make it big. But I had to go right back around the next year and work for another, you know, uh, management company where I had other issues. But again, the fact that I'm here is a testament that just because it doesn't work out the first time doesn't mean you're wrong. Sometimes it's just an idea and a revelation of what you desire and prove to you that if you know you're meant to be here, you got to keep going until you make it right, you know? Yeah, and I want to jump into that in here in a second in terms of, you know, what was it about these management and these large companies uh, that, you know, was really keeping you down, keeping you from achieving your, your true purpose and your full purpose um, as well. And then I want to get into uh, just the purpose broker and what it is. And then, you know, how can our community and how can our audience really benefit from what you're doing? Uh, but before we do that, uh, thank you for, for tuning in. As a reminder, I'm here with C. Marie. Uh, C. Marie is the purpose broker. And uh, today we're talking about her story and also tapping into your why uh, with, uh, with C. Marie. And uh, yeah, hopefully you know, everyone out here can help find or you know, find their purpose uh, so we can continue to build stronger and uh, better Black communities, uh, not just nationwide, but worldwide as well. So if yeah. you are loving this video um, and you know, you, you're liking the content that C. Marie is dropping, please go ahead and show us some love by pressing the thumbs up button on YouTube. Also, make sure that you share this video with whoever you think needs to see it and make sure that you subscribe to our YouTube channel if you would like to see more video and more content uh, like the interview uh, that we're doing with C. Marie today. Yay. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, so your positivity just ra radiates. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, you were going through all this. Yes. And I think it's something I want to go back a little bit because I think this, this particular point is something that a lot of people in our community struggle with, especially where, you know, um, the fit into corporate life, the mm -hmm. fit into these large organizations. And, you know, when we graduate from college and, you know, come out with all this debt, we think that it was going to be all worth it when we get the good corporate job uh, mm -hmm. that you know, we'll be able to do, you know, affect a lot of change. We'll be able to do mm -hmm. what our purpose is, our calling is, make some good money along the way. 
um, mm -hmm. as well. And then what happens, you know, a few years in, we leave unfulfilled or right. we're stuck. We're right. stuck, we feel stuck in those positions where we feel like it's just sucking the life out of us every single day, uh, slowly but surely. Mm -hmm. So from your perspective, you were talking about just changing the system and how difficult it was. Mm -hmm. What were some of the main challenges and some of the main things that were keeping you from, I guess, being successful or wanting to stay in that particular corporate type of environment? Yes. Wow. How long do we have? <laughs> you know, I, I feel that it's um, what we're experiencing, experiencing on like a sort of microcosm uh, level of the world is the same thing that we see at the heights of our society when it comes to at least the US, because that's all we know. And that's the hypocrisy. That is the face, the cover up, the story that we're told about the freedom, the opportunity to live our dreams if we just, you know, believe and do these things. And then there's the systems, the buildings, the um, institutions that are made up of people. They're, see, even though we're saying words like institutions and systems and all these things, they're made up of people that are institutionalizing old frameworks and thoughts of being. And so even if at the crux of these institutions, they've got their values written here on their website and they've got, you know, just maybe one or two di dynamic leaders that actually seem like that. If the body that you are being housed in doesn't really believe in our practitioners of that, your own network can't survive in that body. So for me, being a black woman, and I'm so thankful that you asked me the opportunity to speak about this because I think we often talk about, you know, the black man, which is important, but with the black woman experiences, we can't entertain conversations about sports. We can't join in on the manhood talks. So, um, you know, not that you all just want to talk about sports or, you know, religion, whatever they may typecast you as. But at least in some way, there's a sort of space for you to, I don't know, play the game if you feel like it, you know? For me, it was just, it was totally isolating. It was like, we're, we don't, we see black women as beneath us. You know, now a black man, yeah, we, we may not really respect him, but at least we look up to him in terms of sports, hip hop, you know, what have you, you know? So you all talk about um, opportunities for the black men. There may be 50 black women as secretaries, but that's not what they want to do. They don't want to be glorified secretaries getting all of these PhDs and so forth. So I had two really bad experiences. I had um, the Caucasian colleagues that I had really not wanting me to shine. And then I had black males who I thought would be sort of like my father in terms of mentoring, in terms of, okay, you know, I have this situation, should I go to HR? And to me, it almost, it felt like from them, I had to give some booty or something to just get an answer about the way things work. You know, I, I'm just being real with you. You know, I'm just being real. It, it, I felt stuck. I felt like I'm getting it over here and they don't really have my back or they sort of let me know, hey, you know, you can be a glorified secretary. I'm the chosen one of the Blacks. You know, just all of this structure going on, all of this <laughs> houseness, <laughs> you know? So, <laughs> this houseness, huh? <laughs> so, you know, for me, it was like, I know I am a born leader. I'm a born leader. Um, and, you know, no one is going to make me feel less because I'm a black or because I'm a black female, make me feel like I'm booty. Or make me feel like, you know, you always have to go through these mechanisms to get up here. It's the same way, you know, with the church. It's, you know, you got to take these steps up to get to God. No, you don't. You, we were born to make manifest the glory of who we are and why we are chosen. And so for me, it was very worth taking the risk that I took. It was very worth. I used to drive 40 minutes down to Shape Community Center in, this, in the uh, hood. And they would be like, why are you here? Because it just kept me happy. It kept me going um, to be around my people, to host the Pan-African festivals. I may not have had enough mo as much money, but doing those things, being engulfed in my passions kept me going and moving towards the alignment that I need to get to, get to where I wanted to go.